inspired him because he believed in song and music and art. He believed in poetry. And he was forever shining. And his head was surrounded with light. And his light brought peace and joy to men and to the whole world. And in the time when he was created to meet the evil things, Odin went to every living creature upon the earth and bound them with an oath that not one of them would ever injure Balder the Beautiful. Not a rock would permit itself to be thrown upon him. Not a tree would allow a branch to be fashioned into an arrow or a spear to injure him. Not a human being would touch him. Everything was bound by an oath. And Odin was very confident that perhaps he had outwitted this strange, morbid destiny that hung over. <coughs> a destiny is greater even than the gods of the Northland. For in his great pact with life, he had asked everything and everyone except one. And he had failed to ask a little branch of mistletoe that grew high on another tree. He had asked the tree, but he had not noticed the mistletoe. Now it was obvious that uh, such a circumstance was very humiliating to the mistletoe. So that instead of being happy with everything else in this voluntary agreement, the mistletoe developed a grudge. It would have been perfectly willing to have agreed but was very, very unhappy because it had not been asked. And it was later that Loki, the adversary, that evil spirit that is forever present, the god of fires, the backbiter, the cynical one, the Mephisto of the divine group, that Loki should discover this fact. And to revenge himself upon Odin, he caused an arrow to be fashioned of this mistletoe. And he placed this arrow in the bow of Hoda, the blind god. And he pointed the arrow because the blind god would not knowingly have done this, but he was blind and did not know what he was aiming at. And as a result of that, this blind god slew Balder the Beautiful. There is another legend to the effect that everyone uh, fired arrows and stones at Balder as a game because they knew none could touch him. And then Loki insinuated this arrow into the game and thus brought about the death of Balder. There are many legends, but this is the substance. Balder the beautiful died. And with the death of Balder, all the joy of the gods died. And when this occurred, Odin knew that he could never outwit the inevitable, that the time had come and must come when the way of the mysterious destiny of things would be fulfilled. He had never been able to fathom the mystery of all father. He had never been able to determine the secret of the world. He did not possess the power to form things in eternity, only in time. And that time must end. So this melancholy struggle against inevitables follows on down through the entire story of the ring. And then Odin reconsiders the possibility that if he can never achieve the mystery, perhaps the world can be saved in another way. Perhaps the mystery can be solved, if not by him, by something that he creates. So he set himself apart to fashion and dream forth a creation that should save the world and save him. He would devise a strategy. And he created in his wisdom a people set aside to do his will, a chosen people. And these people were called the Volsungs. 
the race that was fashioned by Odin himself, bred from his seed, and was to produce as from the tree of a race, as its final fruit, its final harvest, the hero of the world. Now, Odin believed that when Sigmund and Siglindi came along, that Sigmund would become the father of the hero, or might even become the hero himself. But again, strange powers of fate intervened. Because Sigmund and Siglinde, brother and sister, fell in love with each other. And as a result of this incestuous union, the great goddess of law and virtue, Odin's wife, demanded that Odin destroy his own children for having broken the laws that were upon the runes, or upon the spear inscribed with runes. Broken-hearted, Odin was forced uh, to prevent the very thing which he had sought to attain. But Odin had thoughts. And these thoughts had wings. And of these thoughts there was born his beloved thought, the thought which is himself. Brunhilda, the goddess of the Valkyrie. And in Wagner's opera, Odin uh, Wotan speaks to Brunhilda as his other self, as his own real thinking. And he sends her as his thought, in disobedience, and causes her to save the infant son of Sigmund and Siglinde, and to take him away and hide him, because he was the heir to the Valsung. He was the last of this great line, and he must become the hero of the world. So was born Sigmund, who was truly a widow's son, posthumously born, who knew neither his parents, nor his origin, nor his destiny, any more than did Parsifal in the second part of the cycle, the Grail cycle, who, when asked of his ancestry, could reply only that his mother Herzeleda was the sorrow of the world. And so Siegfried, or Sigmund, lived, brought up by a Nibelung himself, brought up by a little dwarf. And he had the broken sword of his father, Sigmund, the sword that must sometime break the spear of Odin. And he cast, uh, cast and mended the great sword Notan. And he became the hero of the world. He achieved all the wonders that are familiar to the concept of the Nordic and Germanic hero. And in the case of Sigurd, he slew the giant Fafna, who guarded the treasure of the Nibelung. He became master over many things. In the Teutonic version, he begins what Wagner calls the Great Rhine Journey, the journey of life down the River Rhine. But Odin knows, unfortunately, and can do nothing about it, that the hero of the world is journeying only to death. That by the strange laws of fate, Nothing can change the work of the Norns, the three gray sisters who, we, who spin forever the thread of destiny. Odin makes one last great effort, and as Wotan in the Wagnerian cycle calls upon Erda, the Earth Mother, begging her to reveal the secret, the mystery of survival, but she is silent. 
And so, Siegfried, continuing down the great river Rhine, goes his way to the house of the Gibbachung, where at last he perishes with the spear of Hagen in his back. And with the death of Siegfried, the hope of Odin or Wotan for his world, the whole regency of the world created in the dim past out of the frost of Ganungagap, the whole hope ends. Now this is the signal in the Sigurd saga for the last great war. Wagner summarizes it very briefly in the Gotthardamerung. Following the great immolation scene in which Brunhilde rides her horse into the funeral pyre, the waters of the Rhine rise, being the waters of space. We hear the second theme of the Rhine maidens, and we see them capturing the, the ancient ring from the drowning Hagen and carrying it back again to the mysterious abode of the gold of immortality in the depths of the Rhine. Then the waters rise and the universe ends. But the waters do not quite reach the sky. The temple of the gods falls. But there is one mountain peak that survives. And in this mountain peak there hides a man and a woman. And when the floods subside, they are the new Adam and Eve. And with the gods who are gone, the old order passed forever. These two are fruitful and replenish the earth. And the gentle pastoral world of man as we know it came into existence. So much for the Wagnerian termination. For the Sigurd saga, we have a much more dramatic termination. Odin, at the end of his dream, realizing that with the death of Sigurd, the great hope of the Nibelung, the great hope of the Volsung is ended, becomes part of a very intense climactic drama that begins to unfold. First Odin realizes that the moment of the Ragnarok is at hand, the day of the dissolution, when the armies of light and darkness must meet upon the great plain of battle to fight or survival, when the gods and demons, when life and death must come in the great Armageddon, and so Odin and his gods, his aces, his deities, draw themselves up before the great palace of Asgard. And as they watch the pits of perdition open, from Hilheim and all the distant places come the monsters. The Midgard serpent rises, fire belching from the sea. Loki, long prisoned in the earth, bursts his bonds and comes raging with flames upon the field of battle. <coughs> the spirits and souls of the dead who have passed to damnation appear riding in ships made of human fingernails. The saga, the legends become more and more strange until finally comes the great battle itself, the heroes paired off against the villains each one slaying his enemy and at the same time slaying himself. And in the very heart of the battle, at the very heat of it, the earth begins to shake and quiver. The worms gnawing at the roots of the tree of life have gnawed it through. A gracile tree with the three worlds falls back into the abyss of space. Gods and demons, heaven, earth and hell, vanish away forever. And nothing remains but the mist and the great gap in space and the strange, mysterious, ever-brooding presence of all Father, who is neither pleased nor displeased, who is neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, but simply remains forever, observing, knowing, and silent. In substance, that is all we can do at the moment with the outline of the legend. Now we've got to go into certain parts of it. But that gives you perhaps some little concept the way some bard might have spent an evening telling fragments or elements of the story. Naturally, we've had to abridge them 
and leave out many important and relevant parts. But anyway, this is to a degree the spirit of it. Now, what do we have actually when we are dealing with this? We have the problem of many worlds and many levels and many planes brought together in a strange composite. Obviously, from all the accounts, the world of Odin and his gods, the world that passed away in the Ragnarok, is not the physical world we know. Actually, Ragnarok, while it might have some historical, geological relationship to Atlantis or something of that nature, does not basically mean a catastrophe or cataclysm that took place in the material world. Perhaps even the sinking of Atlantis has another meaning also. Perhaps this submerging of a great empire has something to do with the submerging of consciousness, that it is a vast psychological symbol and not merely a factual incident, although it may have foundations, or be tied, as most legends are, to some appropriate factual circumstance. Odin is never born. He comes out of the ice. He is awakened from sleep by the heat of the cow mother licking the ice. We apparently have in Odin the concept of universal mind. Universal mind, which is the demigod, the immortal mortal. Mind can solve every mystery except the mystery of itself, and has remained in this condition ever since. Mind can rule matter, but it can never fathom the depths of consciousness. Mind can order everything inferior to itself, but cannot order itself. Mind can give man a knowledge of all environmental things, or all things which may be weighed, estimated, and polarized. And the world over which mind rules was polarized by the struggle of the frost giants and the flame giants. And so perhaps ruling as regent over creation is this universal mind, which was not born, but was released from sleep or ice. This ice is not so different uh, from the Egyptian use of the symbol, because ancient peoples found that ice was a preservative. Much earlier than the Roman Empire, fish were brought hundreds and thousands of miles across land by being packed in ice uh, for the amazement and entertainment of Oriental monarchs and Roman emperors. Men knew the principle of refrigeration, and they knew that ice preserved. Therefore, in a strange way, the cosmic suspension, uh, which they recognized in this Nordic li uh, land, that creation was periodic, it was a great wave that came out and retired again, like the ebbing and flowing of the sea. And after the day of manifestation was the great night of suspense, or suspension, in which everything remained unchanged or immovable, or was preserved, or caused to float over the abyss like Noah and his wonderful ark. And this thing, everything held as though in a strange fantasy, in a strange grip of sleep, seemingly represented the ice, which like some archetypal structure held things unchanging, undiminishing, until they were released again. The cow mother, of course, represents nature, or the principle of natural emergence. And nature itself, apparently, by these people, was assumed to be the power which brought forth intellect, or released the mind from sleep, probably because nature ultimately produced those kinds of forms in which mind could express itself, or be released into manifestation. Thus nature releases mind by building bodies, refining faculties, and making possible the manifestation of an intellectual power. So Odin is the Demiurgus of the Greeks, the Zeus, or the Jupiter of the Latins, 
not the supreme deity, but the regent of a world, a level of existence. And Odin occupied this middle distance. And Odin, as mind, moving upon the face of chaos, broke it, destroyed it, and fashioned cosmos from its remains. Thus mind brings order out of chaos. Mind destroys the sleeping giant of matter. Mind releases the energies that are locked within it. Mind in its various polarizations represented by its two brother deities also turns ultimately and overcomes the power. It comes again in the Hindu mythology. The great tree that grows upon Miru. It is again the tree of revelation, the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. It is the great concept of the unfoldment of all things in an orderly manner. And the tree has its roots in the unconscious. It has a certain superconsciousness above it, represented by the palace of the gods. And it has its middle distance, or man's normal consciousness. And it places, therefore, the abode of man twixt heaven and earth dominion wielding. It causes man to be in a moderate zone, a temperate field, between the superior and the inferior unknowns. And also it produces within man the concept of evolution, because in some mysterious way, the temple of Asgard, with its palace of the heroic dead, is also the new Jerusalem, the great temple of Olympus, the gods upon Miru, and the Buddhist sanctuary of Shambhala. All these are symbols of that which is to come at the end of the great war of life, those places to which the heroes go. And of course the Nordic heroes dying on the field of battle and picked up by the Valkyrie and carried to Valhalla. These hero tales relate to the adept tradition and those who have achieved uh, the conscious service of the mysterious world mind that guides all things. Now this world mind and the process of growth unfolding as it has through the great stream of life has discovered, for example, that it must sacrifice an eye in Nemer's pool because it must achieve concentration. It must unite itself. It must have single purpose. It must see all things singly and with internal apperception. It must also pass through a certain death that it may live. And it is interesting that Odin uh, should have been recognized by the Romans as equivalent to their Mercury. And both Odin and Mercury were often regarded as gods of thieves because the thief so often ended hanging on the gibbet in the same way as Odin hanging on the tree of life. Also, we know that the legends of Odin gave rise to the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin. The Pied Piper was originally Odin who uh, mysteriously drew all the children with him into the mountain, and it closed forever. All these legends, like the legends of the great huntsman, and all these stories, have their origin in the same tradition. Odin, therefore, to proceed through all of the various procedures and developments of mind. But mind, almost like Hamlet, is a melancholy dame. Because mind, in its own pure nature, within itself, according to these people, was frustrated forever by the realization of its own mortality. Mind is not immortal. The works of mind are not eternal. Mind can build a regency in space, but everything that is fashioned by mind must disintegrate again. And the struggle of mind to become conscious is represented by the struggle of Odin uh, to achieve to the knowledge of reality. Now for Mimer and by the sacrifice of an eye, Odin gains something. He gains the mystery of the runes. And the runes are universal law. 
through concentration of his resources, through the increasing penetrating power of one-pointed reason, by science, which may be the one eye of reason, or the mind. Man has gradually learned by degrees the laws governing nature. He has explored nature step by step and inscribed upon his lance the rules and has used these as the basis of fabricating laws for the rulership of his empire. In other words, he has copied his own ways from the ways of nature. And he has the power to master such knowledge as he may gain uh, from the underworld because the only deity with whom he could converse was the ancient crystal face of Nima. And this face of Nima, of course, is the reflecting face of nature, in which man may learn the mystery of everything except himself. That he may not learn. Nima is the mirror which every thinker holds before his own mental eye to see the reflection of himself and call it truth. This Mystery is unfolded in great detail along the way of our story. So Odin stands forth as a kind of hero. Odin and Moses have something very interesting in common. Moses was permitted to come as far as the mountain of Moab and there look across upon the promised land, but he was not permitted to enter because he, had be, because he had disobeyed the Lord when he had been angry with the rock and when he had broken the tablets of the law. Therefore it remained for Jehoshua, the son of Nun, to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. And Moses saw the land from afar and lay down upon the hills of Moab and was gathered unto his fathers. So Moses, although he led the children of Israel as a great lawgiver, having upon the tablets of the law those very laws that were upon the rune spear of Odin, having walked as the friend of God, was not permitted to enter the promised land. But who was? Jehoshua, which is the original name of Jesus, the son of the fish, none meaning fish. So we have a strange, mysterious analogy there that someone else besides Moses, the hero of the world, by prophecy, must lead the children of Israel into the promised land. It is the same with Odin. Odin could not perfect the creation, even that he had fashioned himself. He needed the breath of all Father. He needed the supreme sanction of deity, but deity was forever silent. It never spoke. It never answered. It never revealed itself. And yet, strangely, Odin knew it was present, because he felt something which was symbolized by the norms, the endless winding thread of fate. Fate that was as much an enigma to the mind as it was to the rest of mankind. And Odin fashioned from himself Balder the Beautiful, representing the highest and most noble parts of the mind. In fact, Odin began in the experiment of Balder uh, to create the concept of the psychic self or the world soul. But Loki, the power of perversion, the animal instincts caused blind Hulda to drive the mistletoe arrow and destroy this first abortive concept of soul because excess destroys soul. And Loki, the god of fires and passion, was excess. Odin, however, did not intend or would not give up entirely the great dream that he had. So he began the ingenious development out of himself of a great order of living things. 
And these living things were to be the redeemers of himself. He created first as an archetype, a concept within his own mind, and ultimately as a projection from himself, the heroic race, the race of the Volsum, the people who should carry on, who should save him, who should redeem him. And this race of the Volsum, according to the Nordic concept, must be considered as symbolizing pre-Adamite man. In other words, universal mind producing archetypal man. Humanity, not upon this earth as we know it, but upon the world that was to pass away, a world of dreams, a world surrounded by the great oceans, or perhaps that world bordered by the Rhine, flowing forever like the river of Tao or the river of time and eternity through the mysterious fatherland of the Teutonic people. So the wholesome represent the creatures or the creation which was to produce the hero of the world and the hero of the world of course is man. Man in whom mind has invested its greatest wealth and its most perfect treasures. A mind carefully, systematically proceeds to the production of what Nietzsche and Schopenhauer have distinguished as the Superman. This is the Superman also in the concept of Marx and Engels. It is the man planned by absolute mentality. The man who is the product of perfect skill. The man who is fashioned with absolute efficiency. But the man who carries within himself the inevitable death of himself. Because Odin like so many ambitious parents, invested his offspring with his own dream. Because actually he created the race of the Valsum, not for its sake, but to save himself. To preserve and perfect his own creation, believing that he could fashion a creature that could excel him and could it do things which he was bound by obligation and oath that he could not do, but which he wanted to do. And he preserved this through his thought, Brunhild, who finally saved Sigurd, the last of the Volsung. But in this plan of his, he pre produced an incest. For these Volsungs became symbolically personified in Sigmund and Siglindi, brother and sister who fell in love with each other. And she, running away from her lawful husband, broke the law of marriage. For these re reasons, the great goddess of the home ordered Odin to destroy this couple who had sinned without knowing it and who therefore carried upon themselves the blind guilt of Odin himself. But Siegfried or Sigurd was saved to become the mysterious power of the hero. And we study his achievements and the four worlds through which he moved and the four spheres of life which he conquered. But we have man now appearing as lord of elements and of material worlds and of things to come, but man still psychological, man still archetypal. We have, however, from the beginning of this, a strange conflict. Siegfried, or Sigurd, turned upon his own ancestor Odin. 
He broke the spear upon which were written the runes of the law. He destroyed the law of old. He also rescued and fulfilled a phase of Odin's life by saving the thought of Odin, Brunhild, from the ring of flames, as we find in the story of the Valkyrie. We find that he also slew the dragon, Godder, guardian of the treasure of the Nibelung. He therefore emerges once more as the dragon slayer, as St. George.